to the People Who Read People podcast. I'm Zach Elwood. This is a podcast about trying to better understand human behavior, and as part of that focus, it sometimes tackles political polarization-related topics, as I believe that these topics are hugely important. I think it's important for people to think more about the underlying psychological and emotional causes behind our us-versus-them anger, and take a wider view of these problems, and to see how our political divides are due to some very fundamental aspects of human psychology which is why so many countries in the past and present end up in similar polarized high conflict states. And I think if more of us approached our problems from that angle, approach things more from a psychological and philosophical angle, and approach things less emotionally and less reactively, the better off we'd be. If you want to learn more about this podcast, go to behavior-podcast.com. If you like the podcast and think I'm doing something worthwhile, please leave it a review on iTunes or another platform. And check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash Zach Elwood. That's C-A-C-H-E-L-W-O-O-D. A few days ago, Elon Musk bought Twitter, and it seemed evident that one reason he did this was because he felt that Twitter censored and banned too many people, and was biased in their approach, and not transparent about their approach. This resulted in a lot of heated debate about what this purchase would mean, and if it was good or bad for Twitter and for society, and what the best content moderation policies should be for a social media company. On today's episode, I talked to Bill Ottman, who is the co-founder and CEO of the social media platform Minds, which can be found at Minds.com. We talk about the idea that social media censorship and banning may amplify people's antisocial beliefs and paranoia, and what content moderation policies a social media platform should have if our goal is to do what's best for society. The Minds platform is known for being a blockchain-based platform that aims for minimal removal of content or banning of people. Bill recently appeared on Joe Rogan's podcast along with Daryl Davis to talk about social media and censorship. Daryl Davis, if you don't know who he is, is most known for his work in de-radicalizing white supremacists. He's a black man who, on his own through personal conversations and direct outreach, has been responsible for many former racists and Ku Klux Klan members renouncing their racism and leaving the racist groups they were in. And this is relevant because Daryl is a part of the Minds team and is part of a team of people interested in de-radicalization who are involved with Minds. Bill Ottman and Daryl Davis and others authored a paper titled The Censorship Effect, which you can read at censorshipeffect.com, which examined ideas about whether strict censorship and banning on social media platforms was effective in reducing extreme beliefs and violence, or whether it contributed to extreme beliefs by forcing people into more polarized and isolated places on the internet. If you're interested in these ideas, I recommend reading the paper. Bill and I will be talking about some of those ideas in this talk. But one thing I want to emphasize before playing the interview is just how complex these problems are, as I think many people these days, due to our anger and us versus them feelings, can take very simplistic stances about the nature of our problems and about what this solution should be. And I think many liberals don't fully understand the nature of this problem. For example, they may not really see how there can be rational and intellectual points that are wrongly classified as bigotry or hate speech or misinformation. And they may not see how censorship and banning based on such interpretations may be adding to our polarization and contributing to the very things people are most angry about. To take one example that stood out for me, on Joe Rogan's podcast, Daryl Davis told a story of attending an event that had been set up to bring people together, people from all different political backgrounds, to discuss things and find common ground. To quote Daryl, the only people who were not supportive were the protesters across the street, some of whom called me a white supremacist. And again, Daryl is a black man. And I think this points at part of the problem we're dealing with. Understandable differences of opinion or differences about how to solve problems, or even people's willingness to discuss ideas with people who believe very different things from us. These things these days are sometimes interpreted by some people as racism or as bigotry or just as morally wrong. And the more these things happen and the more people perceive these reactions as unreasonable and unfair, the more divisive things become. To take a specific example, When someone has rational reasons for thinking liberals are being inaccurate and divisive on issues of race, and they are in turn told that their criticism is racist, and when even black people can be told their views or approach are racist or contributing to white supremacy, people are more likely to perceive the left as either being malicious or even just as intellectually absurd, and those people become less willing to come together and find common ground. So I wanted to preface this talk with the idea that if you can see how Daryl Davis has done some amazing work in single-handedly changing the minds of racists, and if you respect what he's done with that, maybe you owe it to him and others with similar views to listen to their ideas about what real change and attempts at unity might look like, 
Is it possible that often our perceptions of the nature of our problems can be simplistic, and that our views about diagnosing our problems can be biased? Is it possible that sometimes the best solutions to our complex problems might be counterintuitive and may even make us uncomfortable in various ways? Is it possible that our discomfort is necessary to solve our problems? Okay, here's Bill Ottman, CEO and co-founder of the social media platform Minds. Hey, Bill, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. So I have a mostly liberal audience, or at least I think I do. And I think that for many liberals, they don't really see the problem when it comes to big tech and censorship and content moderation, or else they may see it, but think it's such a minor problem. Why is anyone talking about it? So I'm curious if you were making the case to a liberal audience for why there's a significant problem to solve, what would be your elevator pitch? What would you point to the things that have stood out to you as the most troubling in this area? That's, I, that's a great place to start. So actually, a lot of people on the left don't know this, but there is a lot of deplatforming that impacts the left. There has uh, been some really great writing in Wired and Washington Post about this. Wired did a huge piece about LGBTQ creators getting impacted. And actually, Taylor Lorenz just recently wrote a piece about Algo Speak on TikTok and other platforms where essentially more NSFW left wing creators, um, even sex workers, they're basically morphing their language to get around the algorithmic censorship. So, for instance, if there's some explicit word that people theorize is demoting their content on certain platforms, then people will just make up new words for other words. And her framing, she, she interviewed uh, Evan Greer, who is one of the directors at Fight for the Future, which is an internet freedom group, largely progressive, but really trying to wrangle in big tech. And she has uh, great comments about how important it is to support free speech coming from the left and how free speech really is a liberal ideal and principle and that we really do need to depoliticize this conversation. And then that also gets into the idea that maybe the the way that these ways of censoring and removing content and, and posts and accounts, these strategies may be actually amplifying polarization and amplifying anger and creating some of the same, the, the very things that people are, are angry about. And maybe you can well, that's the core talk point. a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, that. ultimately, yeah. if we can all agree that our goal is de-radicalization, I don't know if we can agree on that. And first of all, I'm not, I, I can't make myself associate left or right. I'm very much um, nowhere. But I think that both sides agree that we would like to see de-radicalization occur. So people who have adopted extreme ideology, whether that's religious ideology or racial ideology or whatnot, like we hope that long term they can change. They can change their minds and they can they can sort of see how they've they've gone into this uh, fundamentalism. So maybe the, I'm, I'm just going to go with that assumption. That we hope <laughs> that there is Most some people. sort of common hope for humanity. <laughs> I don't know if that's if if that's the reality, but I'm going to go with it because I like to think the best in people. And so the reality is, based on all of the research, basically that we have found, that censorship, deplatforming results in increased radicalization. It you know people go from one network to another. And oftentimes the networks that they go to post deplatforming are, you know, much more niche, have much less alternate views and can allow the ideology to metastasize. So, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about what works in terms of censorship. For instance, there was one study of Reddit where hundreds of millions of, of posts were analyzed for their language use before and after a uh, censorship initiative came through. And so, yes, they found that they could limit the use of certain language within certain subreddits. 
that's sort of obvious. Like, okay, yeah, if a platform enacts a policy and they enforce that policy or like AI programming, then they're going to be able to alter the course of that conversation and, and limit certain stuff. And so, but, but in the end of the study, they say, well, most certainly these users just went off into other darker corners of the internet. Mm -hmm. Now, Vice came out and says, Reddit study proves that censorship works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is exactly sort of what we're trying to get at as being completely off base in, in the paper that we just wrote called The Censorship Effect. And, you know, it's we have to agree on what what do we mean by it worked? Did we hide it or did we solve it? Yeah, it seems like for many people's perception of this problem, there's the perception of, you know, if they were going to go to Minds, your platform, or other sites with minimal moderation, there can be a perception of, oh, there are bad people on there and that's bad. And therefore, you guys are bad for allowing that. But that's, you know, as you would argue, and other people would argue, that's a very simplistic and emotional view because clearly there will be people we perceive as bad somewhere doing something. And there's an argument to be made that the more you cast them out, the more you repress them, they, the grievances are built up, uh, victimhood, victimization points of view are built up, and it confirms their worst beliefs about the powers that they're fighting about, things like this. So in other words, it's not a simplistic or it's not a simple problem to either diagnose or fix. It's a very complex problem. Yeah, for sure. And I, I, I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding about the potential threat for real world harm or violence from extreme content online. This is one of the topics that we cover in the paper. I'll just kind of read a, a few interesting statistics to you um, about kind of online versus offline radicalization. So only 2% of extremists radicalize only online. About 70% of extremists radicalize alone prior to joining a group. And this one, this one's really fascinating to me. Less than 17% of radicalization is primarily done online. So essentially, most radicalization is happening offline. And the radicalization that is occurring online is not escalating to violent extremism nearly as much as offline radicalization. So I think what that, like, you can look at that through the frame of potential opportunity in that, you know, you can see a, a piece of extreme online content and choose to be triggered by it and really try to get rid of it. Or you can look at it as an opportunity for dialogue, understand, you know, look, at least this person is expressing themselves with their words. And, you know, these are lawful words. Obviously, you know, at Minds, we follow the law. So if, you know, there's true threats of violence, et cetera, like that's gone. Um, also, like th th there are other edge cases that, that w we will ban, malicious spam and harassment. But I think that this online versus like, because the people who are really going to get violent, they know that they really can't be organizing online. They know about the surveillance. They know that, you know, they need to be physically networking with people. So, um, and then this is another really interesting stat. Social media is 10 times more important for Islamic extremists than far right extremists. Not really well known that, you know, there's a dramatically higher percentage of, of Islamic terrorists organizing online. A lot of this comes down to what in the research is called certainty. So certainty in radical beliefs is reinforced by centra centralized censorship that pushes potentially radical people into echo chambers of others who have been banned. So that, that reinforcement of what you were saying earlier, basically, I got banned, I'm a victim, clearly there's a conspiracy going on <laughs> because I got banned, so I must be right. Confirmed, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like when it comes to people's kind of simplistic views about this problem, it seems like to me the there's a lot of conflating of the of what the root causes are. So for example, when we talk about emotional polarization, political polarization, 
it's such a common and well-known dynamic that has happened and has happened in many countries, not just to us over time and even currently. And to me, that is the driving force of these kinds of problems. You know, the more people view the other group as insane or alien, the more they're likely to fall sway to extreme and paranoid beliefs about the other side and about the world. So I think the focus on there's content that's bad out there that people are seeing and they're there, therefore that's what's causing this friction and this conflict is a mistaken view of the problem, a simplistic view, because we're not, we're not dealing with a media literacy problem. We're dealing with the fact that people have very high us versus them views of the world. And I'm curious what you think of that uh, perspective. Well, yeah, I mean, seeing, seeing radical content, you, you should actually, in, an, in a weird way, be more concerned if you're not seeing any. Because if you're not seeing any, well, guess what? That doesn't mean that it's not there. That doesn't mean that it's not on the internet. So creating this bubble on big tech apps where, you know, all controversial opinions are gone, that is actually terrifying. If you, because of the metastasization that can happen in the other places. So yes, like we all, you know, no one likes to see that stuff. No one likes to see hate speech. No one likes to see, uh, well, some people, but most people don't like to see hate speech. They don't like to see misinformation obvious propaganda and polarizing content. However, so we, we, for instance, build this tool, uh, build your algorithm tool where we, as soon as you sign up, we ask people to adjust this slider, sort of changing their tolerance to how much content they want to see from people they disagree with, sort of mm -hmm. understanding people's appetite for engaging with contrary ideas to their own because you know based on our work with daryl davis who for anyone who doesn't know is uh famous for helping hundreds of kkk members leave the kkk he's a black man and he he befriended them and basically inverts the approach and you know has empirical evidence i mean from his own work of this strategy working and in many others in the de-radicalization field uh reiterate this Diacon and just, you know, down the list of, um, you know, people like Majid Nawaz, um, who was a former Islamist. One of the co-authors of our paper was Jesse Morton, who was a former Islamist as well, ran a publication called Revolution Muslim in, in New York City. Unfortunately, Jesse recently passed away. But after he was uh, busted by the FBI and he went to jail for a little while, he basically had this this personal breakthrough and uh, transformation went on to really become an academic essentially in the space and try to try to help with de-radicalization de initiatives all over the world. And in his, you know, in his experience, like it was all about confronting alternate ideas to his ideology, which enabled him to come out of it. So like, this is like basic physics. I mean, <laughs> If you don't put people in contact with the information necessary to transform, then they will not transform. Right. The more you put people, drive them into these other small niche echo chambers, the, the more they're going to become more extreme, et cetera. And that's what I see with your work, you know, that there's, there can be a perception, a very simplistic perception of, oh, look at the, the gross content on mines or, or whatever platform. And that's bad. But they don't realize how much work uh, about de-radicalization that you all have put into this. And it's a, it's a genuine ph philosophical problem that is very complex and isn't conducive to, to simple fixes. And I think people take this view of like, oh, look, there's bad stuff. But I think you would make the case that maybe we, we all need to become more mature and, and see the problem for what it really is. And that would allow us to have less emotional reactions. So for example, to take a concrete example, when I went on mines and I saw some things I thought were, were pretty gross, like I, I saw some info war stuff and, you know, and I think there's that reaction, that instinctual emotional reaction, like, oh, this is, this is bad of them to allow this. But you, I think you would say we need to be more mature and recognize that, hey, maybe this is the best way 
to have this common ground or common platform that we share, even if we think and know that many people on there are, in our opinions, gross and maybe, you know, combined with more algorithm and, and, and options for seeing what you want to see on the pl platform. We just have to be okay with recognizing that, that maybe that is the, the best approach for, for society. Yeah. I mean, you know, even look at the ACLU, you know, they're, they're a good example. Um, and I think that they've actually, you know, they're still sticking to it, but I do think that they've sort of drifted from the core message in recent years. However, they still, you know, openly state that they will, you know, defend bigots, KKK members, if, you know, if they need to. I don't think it's as much as their priority as it once was, but, you know, the ACLU is famous for understanding that free speech is the best way to fight hate speech long term and that the principles in the U.S. have to do with defending people's right to speak abhorrently as long as it's within the law and that 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 is the counterintuitive foundation of our society and yeah it, it, it's it's sort of like in brave new world the whole vibe is more the illusion of a perfect society which is so dark being in a place where everything is just sort of synthetically nice is actually extremely dark and potentially long-term very threatening because you're basically creating a pressure cooker. It's all about the lens that, that we're viewing this stuff through. And I think that people don't approach radical content online from as much of like a mental health perspective. You know, you see, you see some troll posting crazy stuff and you just like roll your eyes and think, oh my God, like Facebook is just promoting this. This is horrible. This is, you know, ruining the world. And it's not as if that's an irrational response. But if you remember that, you know, that is a human being on the other side of the screen and that they do have the capacity for change. And if you be just think about the series of events that will take place if that person gets banned. And what's going to go on in, in their head. And then, you know, you start thinking, okay, so that person gets banned. They suddenly, like, who is really at fault? Is it the alternative networks who, you know, have sort of absorbed a lot of this deplatforming? Or is it the networks who ban, like, because it's all network topology. It's, it's literally whack-a-mole. So... The, net, the internet is the community that we need to be concerned about, not just siloed platforms. Like the internet is the community and just knocking it out of one has mostly negative consequences. It's not, this it is not like a, you know, a hundred percent across the board rule. I mean, there are instances of, you know, bad stuff arising on alternative platforms there are instances of it arising on mainstream social networks. Our thesis is much more on a long-term basis. Like with Daryl's work, he'll engage with these people for years. He'll be on email threads and chat rooms. He'll meet up. And, you know, you don't just force someone to change in like a couple conversations. Like you really need to do the work and be there to listen to them and have that level of patience and compassion. That's really what it comes down to. I mean, and, and ultimately I want to turn this into a peer review process. Mm -hmm. We want to, we're challenging the big tech apps to justify their content policies with empirical data. Because right now we're, and we looked and we could not find much of anything that was truly defending the long-term benefits of the deplatforming. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm totally open to to seeing it, but we really haven't seen much. Right. It seems like they're just basing the decisions on the standard, like how can we meet the demands of our audience, or there are 
bias is either seen or unseen or or whatever. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a concerted uh, research based effort. They do do some research, but they're also very sort of secretive about it. I mean, if mm -hmm. you um, I don't know if anyone watched the interview between Zuckerberg and Lex Fridman recently. It was mm -hmm. pretty interesting. And he was saying that they're do they are doing all kinds of research. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, you know, Francis Haugen, the uh, whistleblower, ha had to be the one to leak it. <laughs> like, why didn't they right. publish it? <laughs> yeah, which gets into a good segue into the value of open source algorithms and, and platforms. And maybe you can talk a little bit about how you see open source being especially valuable in not lending itself to people feeling victimized or, or building grievances. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, right now the grievances are totally justified because of that lack of transparency. You know, if, if the, the major platforms are not being transparent with the community, then the community of course has to speculate that there's, you know, malicious political agenda, you know, maybe so, maybe not. We don't know. We don't have access to the source code. So open source software, vast majority of people, it's sort of irrelevant to in their minds, um, because, you know, they're not computer scientists, they're not going to look at it, like, what do they care? It's just, it's just a principal thing. It's like food transparency, you know, you like to see the organic label on your food, you like to see, you know, transparent uh, labeling mm -hmm. systems that, you know, most people aren't inspecting, but they like to see that because they know, okay, it went through some sort of a, a regulatory process in order to get this, uh, get this label it means that X, Y, and Z about the, the source of the food. And it's very similar with software. And if we should absolutely be able to hover over a post that we're seeing and understand, okay, why am I seeing this? What recommendation algorithm and AI, what variables are contributing to the fact that I'm seeing the, you know, this post? Mm -hmm. And also just giving the user control over the algorithm anyway. So you know, on mines, we just have reverse chronological by default, which is very simple. I mean, that was sort of the original social media contract, which is I subscribe to you and I get your posts. It's, it's a simple thing. And then, you know, now, but now all of the major apps have kind of distorted this because they think that they can generate more engagement. They think they know what you want to see more than you. And they also want to inject ads and all other kinds of stuff in there. So they have changed the default algorithm to be much more of a, of a recommendation feed. And I'm not saying that that shouldn't be an option, but it needs to be transparent so that we know why, you know, are we being, am I being, how much am I being surveilled? Like, you know, everyone has had an experience with getting a sketchy ad that they were just talking about, you know, 10 minutes before and that type of thing needs, needs to be clear. And so, you know, that's one of the things that. I am optimistic about with Elon is that he, that was one of the first things he said is that that Twitter algorithms needs to be open source. And I have been wailing about this for a decade. Mm -hmm. And to see that finally being said, like, look, I'm not, I'm not sitting here like trying to make, you know, Elon's a complex guy. I'm not like little fanboy. I'm, I'm, I'm literally just analyzing the words that he's using no other big tech executive even utters the words open source because none of them are open source and they don't want to be because they understand the power dynamic that they're able to control by not being open source. Right. It just seems like open source is just such a shift in mentality, even, you know, for any industry and for various reasons, like they don't want to show their proprietary information how they do things they don't want it to get stolen they don't want to expose maybe some some questionable practices they're making or biases of whatever sort uh so it seems like there's many things that are you know they, they have to fight against to or companies have to fight against to be more open source and be more transparent one thing i was interested in with minds was when i was thinking about the hardship of content moderation because it is just such a fundamental challenge that will never please everyone. And, and I was interested in your jury selection strategy, and maybe you can talk about how that works. Yeah, this is something that we're really amping up 
um, our development of this year. Right now, the way it works is for the appeals process only. So if a user feels as though we have made a incorrect decision, then they can appeal it and it goes to a randomized selection of active users who vote on it. Um, it has been largely successful. Like our, our moderation team, you know, is the you know, vast majority of the time, uh, you know, it's, it's not contested, but there have been a couple of times, you know, we want to keep ourselves in check with the community and long-term I, ha I have no desire to be like the arbiter. You know, we much more so want a community governance structure where trusted members of the community can participate. And that's really the most complicated thing technically is preventing mobs from overtaking the jury mm. and not enforcing the terms of the site and really st starting to track reputation so that, you know, untrusted people can't participate that like doing that in a way that is ultimately decentralized and portable is is very complex and we're starting to work with some frameworks like did and verifiable credentials and sort of so sovereign identity systems so that you know ultimately these types of uh, reputation uh, metrics can can be taken from one network to another but you know, also approaching it from a centralized perspective is something that we're working on just for the, just so that we can get a working system going. So yeah, later, later this year, we're going to have a big, a big upgrade where we're going to try to bring the community into the initial decision. Like, so after, so, you know, a, a piece of content gets reported, you pick the category for report, it then goes into a queue, which community members can can immediately hop into a queue. So like you could just go pop into the jury if you wanted to, to help to help moderate the site. And additionally, we want to bring it in not only for negative decisions, but for positive decisions. So for curation. So not only what is getting taken down, but what is getting um, boosted up and hel helping have, having the community help categorize content, help verify content, vet it in in different ways so you know ultimately th this is just the more so of the world that i want to live in um where it's not going to be a perfect system necessarily but i i think that it from a principal perspective makes more sense to me as long as you can sort of have confidence in in these webs of trust what happens for like when say terrorists would post like beheading videos like how would your platform handle that kind of stuff yeah, I mean, it's all very contextual. And I think that this is the nuance that's missing from most networks. It, it, it completely depends. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, a beheading video could be, you know, it depends who's framing it, how they're framing it. Are they framing it as a threat? Are they framing it or is it being framed by like a news agency? Mm. So it like that matters in terms of kind of the nature of, of what is this, what is the intent? It reminds me a bit of in poker, the trying to reach game theory optimal solutions where even though your strategy is known, it's still unbeatable. And it kind of reminds me of that same challenge of any game theory optimal uh, solution for a game where it's difficult to create something that works very well and yet cannot be gamed by people who know the strategy, you know, know exactly your rules for, for doing something, uh, reaching a conclusion that still cannot be gamed. And it just kind of reminded me of that. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're on the hunt for game theorists who, who are also computer scientists. <laughs> so, uh, these so tough, are tough solutions. These are the or people that we problems. like talking to. It's, uh, yeah. And, you know, when you're open source as well, like there, there's a little bit of a myth that if something, if, if a system is too transparent, then it's like easily gamed and or, or unsecure because, you know, you're basically exposing the architecture. But, you know, this is pretty much debunked by top cybersecurity researchers. I mean, look at look at a system like Bitcoin, for instance, or Ethereum or you know, uh, you know, just general cryptography. 
open source crypt cryptography is the only acceptable cryptography. No, no one would ever take proprietary closed source cryptography seriously because there, there would just, it could almost certainly have backdoors in it. So battle testing wise, open source, you know, if it's open source, it doesn't mean that it's secure. Absolutely. It could, it could be ridden with, with holes, but open source systems have better capacity to undergo audit and peer review and get more eyeballs on them. So, you know, as long as an open source system has been audited aggressively, then, you know, most, most cybersecurity experts think that this is the best path. And when it comes to people's perceptions of bias of sites like Twitter, I'm curious if you think there can be a factor there of a, of a snowball like feedback mechanism where, uh, for example, the more conservatives leave Twitter, the more liberal dense it is, the more conservative posts get reported, get taken down. And whereas there's less and less conservatives to report offensive liberal created posts. And I'm curious if you think that on its own could contribute in some, in some factor, you know, clearly not all of it, but do you think factors like that can make the problem seem even worse than it is? Hmm. Yeah. You know, I think the number of reports you would hope wouldn't impact the moderator's decision-making. I mean, you know, you could be, well, just because you would hope that they would be, I don't know if, are you assuming that things are being reported that are wrongly reported or accurately reported? I'm, oh, I think there's a lot of wrongful reporting. And I, in other words, I think what I was getting at was, I think a, a lot of stuff doesn't get looked at by Twitter unless it's reported. And then the, the sheer fact that more people are reporting stuff would lead to more stuff getting taken down. Whereas, for example, I mean, I can point to many liberal posts from, from liberal people who are uh, posts are violent or offensive in some way that it, I think if it, they would be taken down if they were conservative posts, but just nobody's reported them because less people are seeing them or, or finding them objectable or, or taking the actions or whatever. Yeah. I think that that is, is certainly likely. And, you know, I don't like to say that I, I don't like to conclude. I don't want to think that there's been political bias within Twitter, but I don't know. Some of these recent leaks are pretty concerning. I don't know if you've seen like the recent Slack leaks no, about the, about the shadow banning. No. Yeah. I mean, it, it, and and we we knew that already. Like this is very. It, it's pretty obvious that there's promotion and demotion happening alg algorithmically and even manually behind the scenes. And so I'm like, to me, we need to hold Elon accountable to follow through with what he's saying about open sourcing and not only open sourcing the current production system, but the version history so that we can really go back in time and understand what occurred, it's probably gonna be ugly. A note here, I wanted to give a little bit more detail about what I meant here in case it wasn't clear. My point definitely wasn't to say there's not a problem to solve in terms of bias and unbalanced application of rules and such. I was just trying to get at the idea that the magnitude of the problem can be exaggerated. The aspect I mentioned is one way it can be exaggerated, just the natural self-sorting tendencies of populations and how that can affect things. I'd also say that I've personally seen examples of where people thought they were being censored or shadow banned, but were just mistaken or confused about how the technology worked. For example, in pro-Trump Facebook groups, I several times saw people thinking that because they weren't able to share a post, it was because Facebook was censoring content, when actually it was simply because the person who had posted that content had had the share ability disabled. And also, just due to the polarization and paranoia each side has, you can have many people taking innocent things out of context, like people saying, hey, my posts usually get more likes and shares, and now they're not, which obviously could be for a myriad of reasons, such as normal ebbs and flows of follower activity, or even of fake account rings getting removed, or whatever. In the episode of the Joe Rogan podcast where Bill Ottman and Daryl Davis appeared, Joe Rogan said he believed that vegan Twitter employees were removing or censoring posts that promoted meat, 
which I found just an absurd take. I mean, for one thing, I don't think Twitter employees are just making one-off biased decisions like that for specific posts in ways that don't align to a set company strategy. And for another, as someone who lives in Portland, Oregon, and is also a vegan, and who has also worked in tech, I think it shows some major ignorance of how little respect and power vegans have, even on the liberal side. That's just one example, but I think it shows how some people can start to see boogeymen all around them and think there's some monolithic left that is all aligned on all these various ideologies. A group of people who are consistently making all these biased decisions across the board. And I think that just shows a lack of understanding about how complex these things really are and about how ideologically diverse liberals are in the same way liberals can similarly see conservatives as basically all the same and much more ideologically aligned than they really are. All this is just to say that in a highly polarized environment, any problem we have that is associated with our political conflicts will inevitably be exaggerated in various ways and looked at through various paranoid framings. You can see this in the fact that there are both conservatives and liberals who believe Facebook is clearly working for the other side. And there are some liberals who think that the New York Times, for example, has a conservative bias, things like this. And I think this is important to recognize, that sometimes our perceptions of problems can be very exaggerated. And this points to coming from a place of doubting whether our perception of the problems around us are really the nature of the problem. Because the more our perceptions of problems are exaggerated, the more angry we are, which in turn causes more conflicts and problems, and so on and so on. Back to the interview. Yeah, and, and to get at your point of the, the problems, the bias in, at, in these organizations, I mean, there's just clearly so much subjective points of view of, of what constitutes offensive hate speech or, you know, for example, some liberals would qualify some types of posts pushing back against, you know, anti-racism, activism, they would qualify some of those views as hate speech or bigotry. And then in the same way with transgender issues, there's people can talk about intellectual pushback to some of those ideas. And some people would qualify that as hate, hate speech. So I think one of the fundamental problems we're dealing with is just, you, we can't even define, you know, objectively define these su such things because we're all going to disagree on what constitutes, you know, something that should be taken down. And I think we sometimes avoid that, uh, you know, people avoid that fundamental topic that it's hard to even define these things, which means that we should take a light approach because we should doubt our own. We should have some some questions about how much bias we have and how much bias that, that we can't see about rational reasons to push back on ideas or, or question, you know, mainstream ideas or whatever. Yeah, I mean, that that is a complete. That, that is a ground zero point about definitions and, you know, what one person intended is not what another person perceived. And, you know, they interpreted it as some sort of harassment meant when it wasn't intended that way. You know, I think that the, the meme that Elon posted where, you know, Tim pool was debating uh, the head of legal at Twitter on the Rogan podcast and, that was um, basically it said what it said. Like she would not admit this sort of divergence in definitions. And I understand that that hurts some people. But again, to kind of loop back to what we were saying in the beginning, let's assume that it is offensive. You know, okay, misgendering is offensive to people. So let's go with that, that it is offensive. Even if it is offensive, banning that person for doing that, if you are trans or if you believe that that is, you know, nasty content, banning that person for doing that is long term not creating the world that I think we both want, which is a de-radicalized world long term. So if you want that person who was misgendering long term to have more, higher probability of evolving their thoughts about the issue, then guess what? Banning them is probably the worst thing that you could do to achieve that outcome. There, and, there, and there's all sorts of other things that you can do so that you don't have to engage with that person. But Engaging them respectfully, civilly, 
would actually probably be the best way to achieve the common goals. I think that, you know, there was a really interesting conversation between Blair White, who is trans, a trans woman, and Ben Shapiro, who obviously has very opinionated views about the trans issue. And she was really like, you know, she prefers not to be misgendered. And she basically got him to agree to to gen to to call her by her preferred pronouns but he did it because he wanted to respect her not because he agrees with doing it but you know the fact that ben shapiro was able to be convinced by blair to do it out of respect to her not because he was being yelled at and forced to so it's just like it, it's sort of a a very simple psychological philosophy. You as soon as you try to convince somebody, they just completely shut down and like don't want to listen to you. But if you engage them kind of in a, in a different type of way, and I know it's hard. Like people people aren't patient, and you know there are a lot of people who are just jerks, and they're just not. And and we also have to be ready to accept that. Right, we are, we are on the internet, I and mean, that it's such a rough place. No matter what, even with the most content moderation, it's such it's such a rough place, full of so much discord and conflict. And what strikes me is just people's unwillingness to kind of sit with that reality that we do. We're surrounded by people that very much disagree with us and may even hate us. You know, it's that that is the reality. And, and I feel like the internet makes us uncomfortable and. and gives us an, a real, very real agitation and discomfort and sometimes stress, but we're dealing with real aspects of the world. And I feel like getting back to that point of the more we try to act like we can escape that there there's costs to that, you know, people are put in these, these boundaries are hidden away, but, and their grievances grow, or we don't have a sense of what the real world is, you know, more and more uh, in our, in our various bubbles. And I think, yeah, I think it just gets back to this, this point about the internet is and, and our growing unwillingness to want to interact with with uh people we who disagree with us or people who are trolls or whatever yeah exactly uh, and i think that developing that muscle is pretty undeniably helpful you know i it's it's not everyone's prerogative obviously to deal with it or you know confront it and, Daryl Davis is a great example. Well, of absolutely. He's found, he, see, he, he's, and, and I'm starting to catch the bug where you, om, you actually start to find joy out of it. Like, mm -hmm. like your, your emotional response is completely inverted, wherein it could cause you severe depression from one frame of mind, but total joy on, on another end because you, you, you feel like you're having an impact. So, and, but, but, you know, I'm not going to say it's all, you know, sunshine and, and dandelions for, for Daryl's work. Um, and, you know, our, our attempt to kind of digitize that work and scale it, but it is undeniably aiding in more of a, you know, less, uh, less depression. I mean, and, and again, that's why the mental health aspect of this is so important. And I think that we need to demand that all all networks are trying to help educate users on like at least this this option because honestly regardless of the the deplatforming policies even with all of the deplatforming that's happening there's still just like endless offensive stuff on on mm -hmm. Twitter and Facebook and YouTube it's not like <laughs> It's not like yeah. they've gotten rid of it. <laughs> no, I was, I was doc. My address, my home address was doxed by a guy, you know, some Trump supporter who was angry at me. And that state, I mean, his account was around for another year. He posted my address twice. I reported it. Nothing happened. And yeah, it's like, clearly you don't solve these kinds of problems. I mean, we're not, we're not solving them. Uh, no, you got to shut down social media. If you, if you, if you want to go down that road, you literally just turn on, just turn off the computers. Just, <laughs> just shut yeah. it all down. Well, that. That's a good segue into you know a piece that I wrote. I, I spent several weeks writing it uh, a couple of years ago, where 
digging into the idea that there are inherent aspects of internet communication that lend themselves to polarization. You know, for example, the fact that we're distant from each other and are more likely to say mean things to each other, the fact that a study from the 1950s showed that writing things down publicly made people more committed to their beliefs. And so I went into these kinds of ideas because I think the the focus is often, is often on these these product choices and algorithms and such, which definitely have an impact clearly. But I, I think the, the idea that maybe fundamentally we're dealing with something that is fundamentally divisive creating, I'm curious what you think of that. And, and, and if you think, if that's at all possible, does it point to the idea that we're, if more people took that idea or that, that delved into that philosophy a little bit more, maybe it just means that we're trying to decide what is the least uh, division creating uh, software? Mm. The correlation with the, you know, physical writing is, is really fascinating. And I guess regardless of that though, I think that Pandora's box is open and it's mm -hmm. not shutting. So, sure. you know, we can't stunt technological innovation because of that. Like the fact that, you know, we're all writing things down constantly and broadcasting them and you know how that re reinforces our our ideas more is is i think that that's a compelling hypothesis but we need to evolve the tools that we have and but i also think that you know balancing it, it really comes down to education and and all of us on a individual level understanding our relationship with technology having good balance in our lives, you know, not being addicted to our phones. And as much as platforms can help facilitate that is great. Um, you know, we've sent out notifications before telling people to, <laughs> to turn off their phone and go outside. And we're, we're holding events regularly to have these types of conversations. We've, we've held event, events with Daryl. We're doing another one in June in New York City to, to have these exact, you know, very similar conversations to this. And just from the from the top down at the company talk about this stuff i mean mm -hmm. it's just like the the big tech networks are not talking about this they're they're talking about it from such a, a a limited view and they're not really giving a a voice to the full debate obviously because it's not necessarily convenient to their immediate goals but you know i do actually believe that this can be good for these companies. And I think like, it seems quite likely that if Elon Musk does what he is saying he is going to do, that Twitter is going to grow. And it is totally understandable that people have concerns about the speech that is going to come with that. But again, there are there are other options there's 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 just other options other than permanent bans for these individuals i mean you you could even have solutions like suspensions wherein you know people aren't suspended from chat so at least you know people like have communication valves open you know and anything is real permanent bans are just not healthy and, it, you know, it's kind of uh, thinking about it much more th so through like a rehabilitation phase as opposed to just an, an outcast phase. Mm -hmm. And um, but it's it's not easy. And I think that there there are also like once you start getting into some of the super dark, edgy content, there's all kinds of lines that get blurred and one one quick example i can give you is that within the anime realm there is a there's a subgenre called lolly have you ever heard of this no okay gear up um <laughs> is this tentacle porn yeah this is worse than tentacle porn um this is basically like sexualized cartoons of children Oh. And some of it is not exactly anime. Some of it is CGI child porn. 
Mm. Where so these are not real images, but they look very real. And so, like in the U.S., in certain regions, this has you know fallen under obscenity laws, and so we don't allow lolly on mines. But there's a lot of debate about it, and I think that it's totally healthy debate. You know, a lot of people will argue that this type of content enables pedophiles to not prey upon children. You know, other people obviously argue that that is ridiculous and just like you you have to not <laughs> you have to not look at this stuff and you have to not, you know, work on not being a pedophile. Um, but that is just an absolutely gigantic debate that um, is worth having. And that that's it's just an example of a a very sensitive conversation, a very difficult conversation to have. Yeah, it gets into the the fact that so many of these conversations, uh, there are so many understandable perspectives that people can have and, and debate around. And then what I see is due to how polarized we are and, and angry we are, so many people are driven to these simplistic like, oh, the problem is obviously this, you know, whereas the truth is that for all of these problems, there is a range of rational conclusions one can come to with the, you know, with at least with the evidence we have for these things. So I think, I think in some sense, it's like, if we're going to survive as a, as a people, as a, as a species, as a nation, it, it, we all have to be more at ease with the fact that, you know, we, we all have these differences of opinion on how to solve these very complex problems or even defining what the problem is sometimes. Yeah. I, I want to ask you real quick, cause I know we're running out of time. I, I wanted to ask you if you had seen some of the pretty weird and in extreme reactions to Elon Musk purchasing Twitter and what you it didn't stand out to you or what, just some of the things I saw around that, which I might read after the episode, but some of the reactions were just so unreasonably polarized to me acting as if he was some evil fascist mastermind and maybe people's information would be at risk of being leaked in some malicious fascist way. And, all, you know, just these. Well, why around. didn't they have that concern before? <laughs> I think, uh, well, we know that, for instance, Saudi Arabia had slash has a major stake in Twitter, m multiple Saudi interests. Um, why, why the, the, the same people who are now freaking out about Elon buying it, like, I don't think that most of them were voicing these concerns about the current ownership structure. The prior ownership structure was not like, in the people's interest the the board was the only person on the jack dorsey has like two percent of twitter stock but no one else on the board had like more than 0.01 percent so it was like the board wasn't even necessarily representing the shareholders because they didn't even have that much stake and again concerns about the 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 information leaks is are totally valid. Like I don't want Elon having access to my messages, but even Elon said this like two days ago, he was like, Twitter messages should be end to end encrypted by default. So I don't think that he wants access to people's messages. I mean, I, do you remember when Twitter got hacked like six months ago, or maybe it was like a year ago. And like they tweeted on behalf of like Elon and Obama and Kanye and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they, posted these crypto scams and like, you know, walked away with a bunch of Bitcoin because people, you know, donated crypto to these fake posts. It's well known that Twitter DMs are totally open. Mod you know, th their admins can, can read people's messages. They're not, they're, they're overtly not encrypted. Actually, the guy, Moxie Marlinspike, who founded Signal, apparently went to try to help Twitter implement end-to-end -end encryption and just walked away because he said it was such a mess working with them and it was so dysfunctional. You know, people should absolutely maintain skepticism of Elon Musk, but also like be willing to see some good in what he's saying as well. And understand, look, we're, th there's not ever going to be a perfect solution. I mean, ultimately, major global communications platforms should not even be owned by corporations. 
these should be open source, public, decentralized protocols that are, you know, operating more along the lines of like peer-to-peer -peer architecture. And the good news is that I think Elon actually agrees with that. And this is what the Blue Sky Project at Twitter has been starting to look at. This is what we're at Minds like deeply researching right now. Like anyone actually can take the Minds code and make their own app if they want to. Um, and what we really want is for users to control their identity, control their content, control their messages. And this is where crypto keys really, you know, this is the future. Like in the future, everyone is going to have a crypto key pair. You have your public address and your private address, your private key. Your private key is what accesses, gives you access to all your messages and content and crypto and whatever. And your public key is your address where people can send you messages or send you money or, or whatnot. And you can broadcast messages out of, out of here. And, you know, the corporation doesn't control your stuff. So even if, even if you get banned, you still own your stuff. And th this, that's just more so the world that we need to move to. And it's more resilient. It's more sovereign. Um, you know, regardless of you're on the left or the right, you would think that people would want ownership of their stuff. A note here. I wanted to give a few examples of the unreasonable reactions I'm talking about. One person who I think is particularly unhelpful, who has around 230,000 followers, wrote a piece about how, quote, Twitter's hostile takeover teaches us how democracies die. This person wrote a whole series of tweets about how Elon Musk buying Twitter was part of fascism taking a hold of America, and how the purchase was all about intimidation of liberals and taking control of society. He also wrote the following, your name, address, relationship, and political views in a file owned by a billionaire with open far-right sympathies. It goes to some pretty awful places, history says. End quote. He also said this, honestly, at this point, history is like the ghost of Karl Marx trying to teach Americans how capitalism implodes into fascism over and over again, and they're like, no, it doesn't. Prove it harder. End quote. Searching on Twitter for the string, Elon Musk fascist. We'll show you all kinds of worst possible framing takes like this one. Elon Musk was born in South Africa, refused mandatory military service, immigrated to the USA as an adult, became a billionaire here, and then began lecturing us on being more fascist, exactly like Trump's grandfather and Rupert Murdoch, except Germany and Australia, not South Africa, end quote. Another person said, if you want to understand the issue with Elon Musk taking over Twitter, try this thought experiment. Whenever he and his apologists say free speech, substitute freedom of fascists to propagandize and freedom of insurrectionists to incite violence, end quote. Another person said, Elon Musk being an utter douche bro wouldn't be so bad by itself if he didn't align himself with fascists, white nationalists, and insurrectionists, end quote. You can find many people on Twitter calling him evil. In short, just a lot of very confident talk about him and about the nature of what him buying Twitter means and about his motivations. And I can understand people being concerned about what it means, but I would argue that we don't yet know what it means, and it's possible good things will come out of it. I'd argue for more uncertainty about what it means and argue we shouldn't jump to conclusions. Okay, back to the talk. With regards to people freaking out about Elon buying Twitter and the, the fear that Twitter will be flooded with you know, conservative voices, trolls, whoever, uh, I, I want those people on Twitter, or, or you know, I, I want to interact with those people. And the same reason I don't block, I've only blocked like two people in the entire time I've been on Twitter, because I, I want people to see what I'm saying. I want to try to convince them of my points of view. I want to start a conversation. And I think that coincides with this idea that, well, you know, what are we gaining by not having those people on Twitter or, or wherever? I mean, I, I think... I, I want them to be exposed to different ideas. Uh, my ideas, anybody's ideas, just because hearing more ideas, I think, is fundamentally depolarizing and, and reducing anger, even if we're dealing with other factors, natural polarization factors that amplify things. I, I think they're, the, the better of, of any of the options is for them to see more points of view. So I think it, it gets back to that. You know, I, yeah, let's. I mean, people are just overreacting to this stuff. Yeah, for, yeah. Forget about the the fringe for a second. Um, you know, the fascinating thing about sort of current polarization is that even just like mainline conservatives and liberals, first of all, consider each other extremists. <laughs> so, 
So like mainstream political ideologies think that each other are <laughs> extremists, mm-hmm. you know, apart from the actual uh, far left and far right. Right. But, you know, to your point, yeah, it's like social media. Yeah. Yes. A lot of people use social media just to interact with their friends and they just want to, you know, post fun stuff and not be bothered with it. But there are a lot of people who care about politics and news and discourse and they they like debates. You know, debates are fun to some people, not to everybody, but to I would say to a major part of the population, debates are extremely intellectually satisfying and people consider it important to the future of society. So Because we know that we can't just ignore it. And if we want to have an impact, like we don't need to just preach to the choir. We need to, to, to talk to people on the other side. And, um, yeah, we need more Daryl Davis philosophy, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. And I honestly, every time I bring up Daryl, a lot, not nearly enough people have, have heard about his work. Almost every time I bring it up to someone who's never heard of him, it pretty much puts, puts them like they're shocked. And it really changes the tone of the conversation because it's just so foreign to so many people mm-hmm. and it's and it's so endearing and real that it's just, yeah, that message is so powerful and effective and it just, it, it it's undeniable really. So yeah, we're that that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to we're trying to spread that philosophy, that openness. And I th- I think it makes people feel more comfortable too because it just provides like a little bit of hope. And it's be, because a lot of free speech people are afraid of it because they associate it with they just have all these bad associations with it. I think Trump obviously politicized it and tried to sort of commandeer it and i think that's why people a lot of people on the left had this visceral reaction just because you know anything that trump said it's kind of like do the opposite right that's the basic dynamic of polarization if the other side takes a stance we have to rebel against that and go the other way yeah yeah i i I think that we're gonna keep spreading the 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 message and honestly (laughs) at this point the message just went about a thousand times more more mainstream because you know now we're going to be seeing this happen at Twitter, and yeah, I, I I just hope that people can can kind of increase that tolerance. Um, yeah, cut, check out come come check out what we're, what we're doing at Minds. Um, if you if anyone read your wants, paper, yeah, read the paper. If you go to minds.com slash change, you can see the paper. You can see. A, lot, a bunch of videos about our Daryl and I were on uh, Rogan recently and we're talking about this stuff. And so there's a bunch of videos there and resources. Daryl's podcast is also on there. So that would be great if anyone wanted to check that out. And I mean, thanks for having me. I, I really enjoy it. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Uh, appreciate your time. It's been a great conversation. That was Bill Ottman, CEO and co-founder of Minds, which you can find at minds.com. I just created an account over there, and my handle is Zach Elwood. That's Z-A-C-H-E-L-W-O-O-D. You can learn more about this podcast at behavior-podcast.com. If you enjoyed this talk, I have many other episodes about the nature of political polarization and also quite a few about social media effects. That piece I mentioned that I wrote about how social media can have inherent traits that may be amplifying our divides can be found in audio form on the podcast, too. If you think I'm doing good work with this podcast, please leave me a review on iTunes, which is the most popular podcast platform and the best place to leave a review. I spend a good amount of time working on this podcast and make no money on it. So if you want to donate some money to me to encourage me to do more, you can see my Patreon at patreon.com slash Zach Elwood. I'd also add that when it comes to the ideas discussed in this episode, that I have no firm opinions on these things as I find the problems in the intellectual landscape so complex. I do think that the main problem we're dealing with these days is about our us versus them polarization. And this means that no matter what policies anyone institutes for pretty much any organization that gets political attention, those policies will leave a large percentage of people dissatisfied and angry. And that's just the nature of what polarization does to us. So I don't feel that there are any solutions to social media or news media that will really solve that fundamental problem. But I do think that the problem would be helped if more people recognize the psychological root causes of polarization and grappled with the true nature of our divides and why polarization is so common. 
and maybe that would lead to people expecting less from social media platforms and news organizations and such, because at the end of the day, there will always be fairly arbitrary lines drawn and rational disagreements of various sorts about what is true and what is fair. And there will always be various biases at play, and some of those biases will be completely invisible to the people who have them. I think part of our problem is expecting too much from these organizations because they are just companies. They are a bunch of people with various goals and various biases. In the same way that I think we need to lower our expectations about the role of governments and nations. They are just, at the end of the day, a bunch of people. And it's not surprising that a good percentage of us will disagree with what any person or organization or government does at any given point in time, especially as a society grows more polarized and more angry and things become more turbulent. I'm just saying that I think we need to cut each other more slack and attempt to see the rational, understandable reasons for other people's actions as much as we're able to. Thanks for listening. Music by Small Skies. <laughs>